Happy Friday, everyone. It is Good Friday, which is the Friday before Easter, and it has been a couple of weeks since I have been on here to post a video. Not going to lie, it has been absolutely crazy um, with the team running the day-to-day -day operations, even with all the help that I have. I have barely been able to find the time to jump on here, but I have a good one for you today. I took a poll on Instagram and I asked everyone, what should the topic of my next video be? And the majority of the votes came in at how to become a master objection finder. The reason I like this one so much is because it really helps give you a better understanding of why in the heck are we asking all of these questions in discovery? It's not just because we want to pretend like we're smart and we know what we're talking about. We actually have a method behind the madness and it's an opportunity for you to start putting the pieces of the puzzle together so that you can feel confident in asking the questions. All the questions I have in my script help you uncover possible objections that you're going to walk yourself right into at the end if you don't figure it out early enough. If you're just now finding this channel, thanks for being here. My name is Dana Neeson. I run a telesales team for Tailored Legacy. We only sell one product, final expense, with one carrier, Lincoln Heritage. And my job here is to help you have stronger, more sophisticated sales conversations. All right, so I have written down the main questions in discovery, and I'm going to try my best to list them here on the screen and then put the corresponding objection that I'm trying to mine for so I can start planning on how to tailor my presentation to this customer to um, overcome that objection early and create more urgency for them to want to make a decision today. The first question, the first question on my script um, is what caused them to inquire in the first place. Why is this a objection prevention question? Well, if their answer was that they saw an ad that said they could get $250,000 for something crazy like $15 a month, wouldn't you want to know that? <laughs> if you don't uncover the possible reason that they inquired, which might be a completely unrealistic or unreasonable expectation, guess what objection you're going to get at the end? it's not enough coverage or it's too expensive. So finding out what caused them to inquire is incredibly important. The most common reason that people will give you will be that they're getting older. So that by itself is not enough to understand what objection you're preventing. You'd have to get below and beneath the surface of that and find out, well, what about getting older has you thinking that maybe now's the right time? Depending on what the answer you get for that question will determine if there is already a sense of urgency or if it's something you're going to have to create because the objection for that is, well, I'm just going to wait or I want to think about it because we don't really know if there is already an immediate sense of urgency. Second question is, do you already have any existing coverage in place? right? We want to know if they already have a policy in place, how much coverage it provides. We need to know because of that, if that is a yes, why they're looking for additional coverage. Uh, if that is in fact the reason, this isn't a replacement question, although you could be mining for objections in a replacement question too, but let's keep the path of, um, yes, I have coverage. I'm looking for more. If you don't find out the reason that they want more, why they wouldn't just keep what they have to take care of the expenses that, that are important to them. The objection you'll get at the end is, well, I'm just gonna keep what I have, okay? So you have to start writing these things down and noting that these questions are far more valuable than you're probably giving them credit for. You also need to find out if they have any sort of savings or investments or anything else that will serve as additional funds for their family if something were to happen. This is regardless if they have life insurance or not, um, because what's the objection if they do have something? I'm just going to keep what I have, right? So you have to start pre-planning some of this stuff so you can refer back to that throughout the entire conversation or it will 100% come back to bite you at the end. If they don't have any insurance in place, that's good. However, there's a laundry list of questions that you have to ask underneath that to find out 
how serious they are, or if this is something that you're going to have to work extra hard for, or if it's going to be a little bit easier for you. Whether or not they have insurance or not, you have to understand what they've been doing prior to getting on the phone with you. I tell all my agents, this is our patient intake. So when you go to the doctor and the first person you see is the nurse and they're asking what brought you in today and they're getting sort of a patient history, that they do that because it helps give the doctor a bigger picture of what is going on with you, as opposed to just addressing your symptoms and diagnosing you and treating you. This is the same with our customers. We're not just going to take their surface level answers and just diagnose and quote without knowing where they came prior. So you have to find out like how long they've been looking, what they've found, what caused them to not move forward with other policies they've talked about. I don't need to know the names of the companies. I don't need to know how much they were quoted um, <clears throat> specifically because we don't want them to think that our price is indicative of the prices they've already gotten because that's not how it works, but they don't necessarily know that's how it works. So let's say they have been looking for, um, actually let's say they just got started. They just started looking. You happen to be the first person that, they, that they're speaking with. That objection that you'll get at the end is, I wanna shop around. So you better do a very good job in your presentation, depending on what type of policy you're identifying makes the most sense for your customer, that they know that no matter how many people that they talk to, price is going to be all relative as long as you're looking at the same type of policy. If they've been looking for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, that's a big red flag. The objection you'll get at the end there is, I want to think about it. You know, I'm not ready. There's no sense of urgency for the for the people that have been looking for weeks or months. Um, it's not that they're shoppers and they're going to waste your time. It's that nobody has given them a good enough reason to change their current situation and move forward with you. So they are the ones that need to be educated the most so they feel comfortable changing their situation. If they have been shopping on and off for years, this usually tells me that they're shopping for something that doesn't exist, that they can't get. They don't understand it. <clears throat> and nobody has taken the time to help them understand it. So they either stop their shopping and stop looking and they just don't get anything at all. Or you help them understand it and, and challenge them to it's finally time for you to make a decision and change your situation. Because the objection at the end you'll get is the same objection that the hundreds of agents have gotten before you, and it's your job to stop the pattern, okay? So why they haven't bought with other companies if they have been shopping around? Usually the answer you'll get is usually one of two things. The most common answer you'll get is, well, it was too expensive. I couldn't afford it. So if you don't understand what is too expensive for them, what is I couldn't afford it, what that means to them, guess what objection you're going to get when you give quotes at the end? It's too expensive. That's the most obvious one. So mine for the reasons why, so you can help them understand and have better expectations before price even comes out of your mouth. The other reason that people didn't buy is because they've gotten declined. Now, if you're selling final expense like we are, there's very, very few reasons why people would get declined from getting a final expense policy. So that tells me that they have been applying for term policies or other types of policies that require you to be in better health. So I have to figure out how much coverage they were hoping to get, what expenses are important for them to take care of, you know, what happens if you don't get a policy at all? Um, are you going to be okay with that? I have to have the conversation that something is better than nothing, and I have to get them to agree. Otherwise, what's the objection you're going to get at the end? It's not enough coverage, right? Or it's too expensive for the amount of coverage you're offering me. All this stuff is predictable. You can find the objections if you actually ask the questions. Another question we ask in discovery have you ever had life insurance before? What objection would you be preventing if someone says no? Well, or I guess I should say, what objection would you be finding if someone says no, they've never had life insurance before? I want to shop around objection. 
If they've never had it before, they have no idea how it works. They're getting bombarded with calls. Agents are commission breathed <clears throat> and one track minded into saying, oh, this is what you want. Okay, this is what it costs. Instead of really helping the customer understand how it all works. If you don't know <clears throat> whether or not someone has ever had life insurance before, you're walking in the blind. How could you possibly understand how to help someone if you don't know where they've been? Okay. Next question in discovery. We want to know who the beneficiary is, right? And it's not so that we can start getting our customer to picture in their mind who is going to be affected if they don't have a policy or who would benefit from getting a policy. It's to mine for objections. So what if the beneficiary is the spouse? Guess what objection you're probably going to get at the end? I want to talk to my spouse. Same thing if the beneficiary are the adult children. You are more than likely going to get, I want to talk to my kids objection. Both of those objections have to be treated separately. Most people take the wrong approach. And when I say the wrong approach, they want to um, hold the client accountable for being able to make decisions on their own, which I think is a mistake. They'll say something like, have you talked to your kids about this before? Are you able to make decisions on your own? Or is this something you have to talk to your kids about first? I think that's weak. Same thing with the spouse objection. Um, you know, have you talked to your spouse about this? Is this something you can do on your own? You do not have any sort of trust or rapport built up enough at this point in the conversation for the customer to even be honest with you, right? They know you're a salesperson. They know you're trying to sell them something. <clears throat> Walls are up, okay? Walls are majorly up. You have the Great Wall of China sitting in front of you in the first 10 to 15 minutes of your call. They're not going to want to tell you, yes, I can make decisions on my own. And even if they do, that still doesn't mean they're they're not going to say that at the end. Holding them accountable for them being able to make their own decisions is just going to be a pressure conversation at the end. So knowing that there's a spouse involved, knowing that there are adult children that are the beneficiaries, at this point, we want to create the urgency and the emotion, right? Because we know that's going to be important um, to address when we get to the end. So I imagine, gosh, you probably don't want your spouse or you want your kids to have to come out of pocket and pay for this if they didn't have to, right? And so your kids, you know, them not having to come out of pocket, I guess, can you tell me more about that? Or why is that so important to you? And Instead of, can you make decisions on your own, get the customer to open up to you about what's going on in their kids' lives, what's going on with them and their spouse that would put them in a rough position should something happen and there was no life insurance in place. That will create more of a sense of urgency throughout your entire call. So when you get to the end, you have to be the one that brings it up first because you're going to get the spouse objection nine times out of 10. So if you bring it up first and say, so I, I know you're going to have to talk to your wife about this. This is a very important decision. Can I just ask, do you like everything we've talked about today? And if you've done what I'm teaching you to do over the hundreds of videos that are on this channel, you've already got your customer to tell you how much they like it and how much they want it. So if you're the one that brings up, I know you need to talk to this person. I know you need to talk to that person, but do you like it? Right. Right. Let's pretend they were here. You can you can prevent these objections before you give money if you're doing it the right way. Then when you make a recommendation, you purposely say, let's just put the start date out by a week or two to give you enough time to make sure you and your wife are on the same page with the amount of coverage that we're talking about today. So that way, if she or he wants to make any changes, you have plenty of time to make changes. Plus, you can also make changes after the fact. As long as this is something you want, the amount of coverage and the price, that's the easy part, okay? So pre-planning this stuff in the beginning will help you adjust how you're recommending your, your um, quotes when you get to the end. Okay, so that's with the beneficiary. You also have to find out what expenses. What expenses are most important for this policy to pay for if something were to happen to you? 
If you are only selling final expense insurance like we are, <clears throat> do not put them in a final expense box. Just because you sell final expense insurance doesn't mean that's the only thing that's important to your customer. And if you ignore it, or if you push it aside and only focus on what you sell, the objection you're going to get at the end is it's not enough coverage, right? And so bringing all this stuff up to the surface is making you a much better sales professional, not just a life insurance agent. You are turning into more of a business consultant. You are looking at the bigger picture of what is important to this customer and how and if can we possibly help them with what you provide. And if you keep acknowledging all of the things that are important to the customer on how it could possibly work, or even if it doesn't work, what other types of policies and recommendations could you suggest they look at so that everything is taken care of? Because if you don't do that, and you're only focused on what you sell, they're either going to want to continue to shop around for a policy that can provide everything for them, right? So that's the, I want to shop around objection, or I want to think about it objection because they don't want to tell you, or they don't really understand. Um, and so you not addressing what is important to the client on a much larger scale, instead of just being laser focused on what you sell is a huge mistake. Um, it will definitely help you give proper recommendations when you get to the end and justify those with the reasons that are important to the client. Just yesterday, I was doing a sales call review with one of my agents. The client had a $25,000 policy, vocally said, I cannot afford anything more than $130 a month, which is what she was paying for this $25,000 policy. The, the agent unfortunately did a poor job of listening to the answers that the client gave. She asked a lot of the questions in the discovery, but when you don't understand why you're asking them and you don't mind for those answers in a way that helps you tailor your presentation to help your customer, your, your recommendations at the end are gonna be weak and they're not going to serve the client any purpose. So after going through everything, the client really loved the FCGS that Lincoln Heritage provides, loved how we could advance money to pay for the cremation before the death certificate is even received. However, the agent, I don't know where she got 10,000 from, but she just said, so you asked for 10,000, let me give you 10,000. And that quote ended up being $71 a month. Guess what? That conversation lasted 30 more seconds, said, I can't afford it, but thank you for your time and click after a 20 or 25 minute call. She was not able to prevent that objection because her recommendations were not good enough. So what would I have done? Knowing that she has a $25,000 policy and she just got it by the way, three or four months ago, you're either looking at a possible replacement if price is competitive. And if not, my recommendation would have been to possibly lower her $25,000 policy that she currently has to 20, see what options are available to do that, and take the remaining 5,000 and put it towards a policy with us that's just there to take care of those immediate expenses when you pass, and hopefully none of that costs you any additional money, right? Before I even give price, do you like the idea of that? Do you think that would solve all of these problems by still keeping the integrity of the amount of coverage you have but also taking a portion of it and making sure that your kids do not have to worry about where that money's going to come from on the worst day of their lives. Okay. That's just one example I wanted to share with you on how we sometimes need to think outside of the box in order to help our clients get what they want. Last question on our discovery, and I'm sure there's a few more in here that I've missed, but these are the ones that I chose to um, talk about for this video is the consequence question. Now, the consequence question isn't always relevant, especially if someone just got a policy and you got them into a conversation because you wanted to give them one more quote, right? There's really no consequence question for getting a policy with you because they just recently bought, so they see the value in getting a policy, period. So the consequence question is really relevant for people that don't have insurance and they're looking for some, or for people that already have insurance and are looking for more or possibly you know, they're in a position where their term policy is about to cancel and they're looking at options to replace it. 
Now, before I explain the consequence question and what objection you're going to mine for that, if someone does have a term policy and it's about to cancel or they have a policy through work and they know they won't be able to take it with them and they want to see what options are available for independent insurance, you better find out how much longer it's going to be till that policy cancels, how long it's going to be until that person retires. Because if that time frame is not for a year or two or longer, what's your objection? I'm just going to wait until it gets closer, right? You have to mine for objections. So you know how to handle that to create more urgency. So they want to make a decision now, as opposed to waiting until it gets closer to losing that policy. Okay. This is all stuff that has to go through your mind in the first five to 10 minutes of your conversation. So we're going to finish this up with the consequence question, which is, have you thought about what would happen if you <clears throat> didn't put something in place at all? Or have you thought about what would happen if you weren't able to find some additional coverage at an affordable price that would help um, close that gap between what you have now and what you want, right? So guess what? They're going to tell you what the objection is. In, in number one, if they don't have any insurance, and you ask them, have you thought about what would happen if you don't get any? Guess what? They're going to they're gonna tell you what their plan B is, which is exactly what you need to find out. The plan B is, well, I guess my kids will just take care of it. Well, I have a sister's cousin's uncle's aunt who's very wealthy and pays for everybody's funeral. She's just going to do it, right? Or whatever the answer is, your next question, but is that what you want? Do you want X, Y, Z? Is, is that the fallback plan that you want? You know, why not? Okay, overcome the objection now. It's literally being served to you on a silver platter. So why not take advantage of it? Get out of your own way and stop being uncomfortable asking hard questions. If they have extra coverage and you ask them what would happen if you didn't find something else, they're most likely gonna say, well, I'll just keep what I have and make it work, right? So if you know that's what the objection is, your recommendations better be very strong. You better really understand why they don't think that they have enough coverage, how much more they're looking to get. You better find some problems and solve them so that when you get to making recommendations and giving price, it's a very obvious choice to move forward with you. Okay? So I just gave you a ton of questions that you can ask your clients that will help you uncover and discover the possible objections that you will get at the end of your call. And you can avoid all of them if you know how to take those red flags and tailor the rest of your presentation to address them before you get them. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I really hope it helps you in changing the way that you think when you have sales conversations. And I will see you on the next video.